message is brought to you by Ven Moody and the Worship Center Christian Church, where we are committed to honoring God, unifying communities, and building people. We hope you enjoy this message, and thank you for supporting our ministry. As you take your seats, I want you to open up your TWC app, and if you're sitting next to someone uh, who doesn't have the app, uh, be a great friend. Show them very quickly how they can download our app um, from any app store. Uh, and I want you to open the app, or if you've got your Bible, I want you to open that up, or you can follow along with us on the screens. And I want you to meet me in Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. We are starting a short uh, series called the Comforter, because today is a very, very special day in the history of our faith, and I'll talk more about that uh, in just a moment. And so I want to start by looking at Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 3, and it says this, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave, talking about Jesus, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift or for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. Now, look at this. Jesus goes on to say, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Some translation says, says comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. As we're starting this short series called The Comforter, by way of uh, our time today, I also want to give you a secondary subject. I want to start off by talking about the comforter, but as a secondary subject, it is this, another baptism, question mark. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that today is a very special Sunday, and it is because today is Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday is a very, very big deal as it relates to our faith. Now, that may be new information to some of you, depending on your background and, and uh, what church background you maybe came from, or even if you're new to the faith through the worship center, then you may not understand the weight of that statement. Many people think that the biggest day uh, for the Christian faith is Easter. Easter is, is that day that many people who never go to church all year, they're going to go to Easter, you know, go to church on Easter most of the time. Uh, many churches around the world are full on Easter, partly because people think that that is the, the biggest, most significant day of our faith. Uh, and we focus on, you know, Resurrection Sunday, that he got up, and, and that is significant. But the truth, scripturally, is that the climax of our faith is not Easter. Easter is a big moment. But the climax of our faith, the biggest times of our faith, happen actually after Easter. The climax of our faith 
is that when, when Jesus ascends back to heaven, and then also on Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit is revealed. This is why uh, in many Orthodox uh, traditions, or maybe even in the Catholic tradition, after Easter, there are other holy days. There is Ascension Sunday. Um, there are some Methodist uh, and other denominational churches, Lutheran churches and Presbyterian churches that recognize uh, these additional days. After Easter, 40 days after Easter, is what's known as Ascension Sunday. It celebrates Jesus ascending back to heaven and taking his rightful place uh, on the throne uh, beside God the Father. That's what Jesus uh, does in Acts chapter 1 and those verses we read a moment ago. But then, 10 days after Ascension Sunday... It's Pentecost Sunday. That's what the word Pentecost means. Pente uh, comes from the root word meaning 50. So Pentecost Sunday happens 50 days after Easter, 10 days after Ascension Sunday. And so these are big days in our faith. This is why in the verses that we read in Acts 1, this is why Jesus tells the disciples, get this, he, he's been resurrected. And he's been spending time, when you look at Acts chapter 1 and those verses we read a moment ago, for 40 days after the resurrection, he's been hanging out with the disciples, doing life with them, breaking bread with them. And on that 40th day, he ascends back to heaven. But right before he ascends back to heaven on that 40th day, he tells the disciples, don't leave Jerusalem. He says, I know, I know that I have called you to be my disciples. I know that I have told you to take the gospel around the world. But first, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes. And this is not the first time that he says this. Those verses that we read in Acts where Jesus says this, that's not the first time that he said it. He said it uh, multiple times and in different places. One account is in John, in John chapter 16 and in verse 7. He says, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the comforter, some translations say the helper, other translations say the counselor, one translation says the advocate, all of those are terms for the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, unless I go away, the comforter, talking about Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, think about this for a moment with me. What could be better than being with Jesus? I mean, the disciples spent three years with Jesus, and now after he's resurrected, they, they spend another 40 days with him, and, and, and you know what happens when you're around Jesus. I mean, the dead is brought back to life. Water is changed to wine. I mean, it's just an amazing time. So what could be better than being with Jesus? Yet, Jesus says in John, it's good that I'm not here. He says, I, I got to go. Why? Because if I don't go, then the comforter, then the Holy Spirit can't come. He literally says, I got to go. Guys, I know we've had a great time. I know that we've seen miracles and we've had great meals, but, but I got to go because you need something beyond me. Ha! Huh, you need Holy Spirit. And unless I go, Holy Spirit can't come. So let me put this in perspective for you. The cross is important because by way of the cross, our sins are forgiven. On, on the cross, what Jesus took upon himself on the cross were all of the sins that you and I uh, will commit, have committed, are committing right now, past, present, and future. All of our sins were on him on the cross. So by way of the cross, we receive forgiveness of sins. The cross is important. The resurrection is important because in the resurrection, we get the ability to have new life, right? Death could not hold him. So because he conquered death, it means that death doesn't have the final word on your life or my life. We get to live a brand new life. So the cross is important, the resurrection is important, but then wait a minute, the Holy Spirit is important too. Pentecost Sunday is important because the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live that life. So by way of resurrection, we get the ability to live a new life, right? We, 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 we have the access to a new life, but you need Holy Spirit, you need Pentecost 
because that's when you get the power to live that new life that Jesus gave us access to. So, Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, the verse we read earlier, he says, John baptized with water. He says, but, but I need you to go to Jerusalem and wait because in a few days you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, so notice, Jesus is saying to the disciples, you need another baptism, another baptism. Baptism, And I know some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, another baptism? I was just baptized. And, and I'm going to walk you through it today because there is a lot of confusion around this issue in the body of Christ. There are, are a number of, of pastors that won't even teach on Holy Spirit for fear of the confusion. And, and let me tell you something. I've learned over the years, I really believe that the enemy is the cause of of this level of confusion because the enemy knows how powerful you and I are when we receive Holy Spirit. And he wants us not to be powerful. The enemy wants us to be powerless. So I think one of the greatest tricks of the enemy is to create a whole bunch of confusion in the body of Christ on this issue of Holy Spirit so that people don't have a vibrant relationship with Holy Spirit. That's the trick of the enemy. So, we're doing this short series because we're going to take a few weeks to really dive into this subject because you have to understand that the Holy Spirit is needed, that He is our helper, He is our friend. You need to know that the Holy Spirit is not weird, that He's not spooky, and you need to know that the Holy Spirit is fully God. There are so many of us who, who, who your prayer, and, and, I, and I feel this so strongly, your prayer right now is, God, I want more of you, or, or, or I want to know you more. And what you're really asking for is more of Holy Spirit. Or what you really need to grow closer to God is a vibrant relationship with Holy Spirit. And so I hope you have your apps out and that you're ready, because I, I'm going to painstakingly walk you through intentionally, Scripture upon Scripture, because we're going to do something at the end of this service on Pentecost Sunday. So I, I want to really start here. I want you to look with me at Hebrews chapter 6 and, and verse 1. And we're going to walk through this so that you understand why Jesus said you need another baptism. What that means for us today. In Hebrews chapter 6 and in verse 1, I want you to notice what the writer of Hebrews says. It says, therefore, leaving the... Uh, discussions of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and the faith towards God of the doctrine of baptisms. Notice the plural. Of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Notice all of the things that are considered elementary principles of our faith, which, which means for those of you that pride yourself on how long you've been a believer, I've got people come up to me, man, I've been a believer long and you've been alive, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, for those of you who pride yourself on how long you've been a believer, it literally means that you ought to be able to teach all of these principles and you ought to know them backwards and forwards. Notice all of the things that are considered elementary Repentance from dead works, faith towards God, the laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And I, I could take every one of these and teach series around them, and, and I don't have the time to do it this morning. But here's what I want you to focus on. He also says the doctrine of baptisms, plural, not singular, not one baptism, several. And he goes on and says, and this we will do if God permits, meaning we'll move on from this elementary stuff if God permits. What, what does he mean by if God permits? Well, in and around our neighborhood, they're doing a lot of building. And, and when, when they're building uh, in and around our neighborhood, here's what happens. you got to lay the foundation, and then you have a building inspector who comes out and inspects the foundation. So if they're building a house, they, they have to first pour the slab, 
laid a foundation, and then a building inspector from the city comes and inspects the foundation. And if the foundation is safe and secure, if it is, if it is right, then the building inspector will give you a permit for the next stage of building. That's what the Hebrew writer is talking about. And I want you to get this because for some of you, your prayer is, God, I'm ready to go to the next level or I want to go to the next level in my marriage or I want to go to the next level in you. Or, or some of you have been praying, Lord, Lord, enlarge my territory. And, and you've been praying big, bold prayers of expansion and an increase. And, and, and here's the thing. God, as the building inspector, comes and looks at your life and says, okay, let me see if your foundation on all of these elementary principles is secure because then I can issue you a permit for the next level. And notice one of the things that God inspects is whether or not you are secure with the doctrine of baptisms, meaning understanding the different baptisms is really an elementary principle of our faith. So I want to walk you through them. N number one, get this. What are the three baptisms? Because there are. There are three. Not one. There are three. What are the three baptisms? I'm going to walk you through this. I want to start in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. And notice what it says. It says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. The first baptism is salvation. A, the, the first baptism is salvation. What does that mean? When you and I gave our lives to Christ, in that moment, when you opened your heart and invited Jesus into your life, in that moment, you and I were baptized into the body of Christ, meaning the corporate body of believers. The moment you gave your life to Christ, whether you walked down the aisle, filled out a connect card, whether you did it in the comfort of your own home, the moment you did it, you became a part of God's family. That's what the body of Christ is. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, and I want you to look at the grammar very closely because it says, for, by, stop right there. That word by refers to the person who's doing the baptism. So look at this. The moment you and I opened our heart to Jesus Christ, we were baptized into the body of Christ. But who did the baptizing? The Holy Spirit. It says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So in this first baptism, who does the baptizing? The Holy Spirit. Where does he baptize you into? The body of Christ. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, wait a minute. How, I, I, what is this all about? Well, 1 Corinthians 12 and 3 also says that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So um, if you were sitting in a church and your heart was touched and you said, I, I've got to give my life to the Lord. You know who it was that, that, that touched your heart, that convicted you to make that decision? That was Holy Spirit. If, if you've given your life to Jesus, it's only because the Holy Spirit drew you. It's only because the Holy Spirit maybe even convicted you. When I, when I had my experience with God and some of the visitations I've had, I was so convicted. My heart was touched in profound ways. Well, the Holy Spirit did that, just like he did that same thing in your own life. So, the moment you decided to give your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit baptized you into the family of God. That's the body of Christ. So the way you become a member of God's family, I, I'm, I'm repetitive on purpose because I want you to see this clearly. The way you become a member of God's family is that you open your heart to Jesus, accept him, and then something happens. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into the family of God. Now, after that happens, if you continue to be obedient to the commands of Scripture, then you experience a second baptism. The second baptism, then, is water baptism. And I want to show this to you. Look at Matthew 28 
and verse 19. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus commanding the disciples to take the gospel around the world and don't just preach and teach the gospel. Jesus says, baptize them. What kind of baptism is he referring to? Water baptism. The second baptism is water baptism. Well, why is water baptism significant? Water baptism is literally an outward sign of what inwardly happens when a person comes to Christ. My wedding ring is nothing but an outward sign of an inward heart commitment that I made 13 years ago to love my wife until death do us part. Water baptism is very similar, and that is simply an outward sign that you inwardly made a decision to accept Jesus in your heart. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. It says this, And you, who he made alive, were dead in trespasses and sin. What does that mean? It means prior to us accepting Jesus in our hearts, we were dead. And let me pause here and tell you this. If you haven't made a decision to accept Jesus in your heart, you are dead. You, you may physically be alive, but, but there is death that covers your life. Your, your, your marriage is not going to be fruitful. Your, your, your business, it's not going to be what it could be. It's not going to be indica- I mean, indicative of, of, of life and life everlasting because apart from Jesus, th- there is no life. So what do we do with dead people? Well, we, we bury them, right? This is why Ephesians 2 and verse 5 goes on and says, and even when we were dead in our trespasses, we made alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what water baptism symbolizes. Your death, your burial, and your resurrection. So, just like in our old life, before we accepted Jesus, just like we were dead, just like we were buried with our sins and our mistakes and what other people said about us, that's why when you are baptized in water, you go down under the water, and when you go under the water, that symbolizes your death, right, and your burial. But then when you come up out of the water, that symbolizes your resurrection. Water baptism is about your old life being dead and buried, who you used to be, the mistakes you used to make, the old stuff you used to do that used to control your life before you met Jesus. All of that old stuff is cut off when you go up under the water. And when you come up out of the water, you come up out of the water, a new person with new life in Jesus Christ. Kind of like Black Panther. Wait a minute. Wakanda forever, right? I love that movie. Uh, my wife and I saw it, and we took our kids to see it. But, but if you've seen the movie, I hope I'm not giving away spoilers for those of you that haven't. But, but uh, when uh, he was becoming Black Panther, if you guys remember that scene, uh, they, would, they would give him the, the fluid or the potion, and then they would bury him. And then, you know, he'd have kind of the visions, and then he'd come up out of, of the ground. And when he came up out of the ground, he was Black Panther. He was a superhero. He had super strength and super power. Well, why did they bury him? Because it symbolized that they were burying a mere mortal, but what was resurrected was the Black Panther. Same thing with water baptism. What goes under the water is your old life. It is cut off. It is over. What comes out of the water is the new person that you are in Christ Jesus. This is why we immerse people, by the way, instead of sprinkling them. My first baptism was a sprinkle. All right, but then, but then later on, I got really fully immersed. Why do we immerse? Because you don't sprinkle dirt on dead people, do you? No, you, you cover them and bury them in the ground. And so we immerse because when, when something is dead, you completely bury it, completely cover it. We also immerse because by default, that's what the word baptize literally means in the original language. Baptizo in the Greek, it literally means to immerse. Um, We also baptize and fully immerse because Jesus was baptized that way by John the Baptist. But go back to Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go back to Matthew 28 and verse 19. I want you to see this. Let me read it again. This is Jesus telling the disciples. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the question. Who does the baptizing in this second baptism, water baptism? Who does, who does the baptizing? The disciples do, yes, right? Or other followers of Jesus Christ. Um, I baptize when we baptize here at the worship center. Sometimes I do it. Sometimes our other pastors do it, or other ministers. Sometimes our deacons are in the pool. But, but I want you to see where that comes from. Because when Jesus tells the disciples to do this kind of baptism, it is the disciples that are doing the baptism, right? The followers of Jesus Christ are the ones baptizing in this second water baptism. Look at Matthew 3 and 11. This is John the Baptist talking, and notice what he says. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Notice what John says. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. John is saying, listen, y'all, y'all have seen me immerse people with water, right? Baptize them in water. But somebody greater than me is coming, and he's going to baptize, but he's going to baptize you into something different. He's going to baptize people with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, when you study in Scripture, in the Gospels, there are different accounts because One account couldn't contain everything that Jesus did. And so you read Matthew's gospel and you see a different perspective on Jesus' ministry. The same thing with Luke and Mark and John's gospel. So very few things are consistent in every single gospel. But when you find something, a story or verses that are in all four gospels, that means it's especially important. And I want to show you that this statement that John makes that it's not just in Matthew, it's in all four Gospels. So we just saw it in Matthew 3, but look at Mark chapter 1. You're going to see it again in Mark 1 and in verse 7. And he preached, this is John the Baptist saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, What? But he will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit. You saw it in Matthew, you saw it in Mark. Let's look again at Luke 3 and verse 16. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Let's go for the final trifecta. All right, John, John 1 and verse 33. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So in these verses that we just read, when John's talking about the kind of baptizing that Jesus is going to do, let me ask you a simple question. Who's doing the baptizing in these verses? Yes, I just said it, Jesus. But here's the next question. What is he going to baptize us with? The Holy Spirit. So the third baptism is the baptism with Holy Spirit. Now, before I take you any further, let's pause for a second and let's review. The first baptism is when the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. That's the moment you open your heart to Jesus and say, I accept you. I want, I want a relationship with you, Lord. You can't see it, but it's happening. Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. You are a part of God's family. That happens at salvation. The second baptism is water baptism. Water baptism is an outward sign of an inward decision to follow Jesus. You go under the water, cuts off your old life. You come up, new person in Christ. Who does that baptism? The disciples, the followers of Jesus, they do this baptism. I'm a follower. I do this baptism. Our deacons, our other pastors and ministers do this baptism. The third baptism is the baptism 
with Holy Spirit. Who does this? Jesus does this. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute now, wait a minute. Okay. I thought when I came to Jesus, I received Holy Spirit. Well, you did, but let me clarify that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. It says, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So let me explain that. So when you decided to give your heart to the Lord, no man can, can say that Jesus is Lord except Holy Spirit draw him. Holy Spirit convicted your heart. That was his work. You said, Lord, I, I, want, I want you as my Savior. I want, I want a relationship with you. In that moment, you don't know it. You can't see it. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into the family of God. You become one of God's children. You're in the family. All right? And when you say, God, I accept you, there is a deposit. There's a deposit of Holy Spirit that is put in our heart. If you can see this glass, this glass has got a deposit of water in it. This is what happens when you give your life to Jesus. There is a deposit that's made. He put the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and it says, as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come, meaning there's more. But here's the thing. The challenge with so many people is this is how we go through life. We go through life trying to make it with just a deposit. This is why there are people who genuinely love the Lord, but they're not living a victorious lifestyle because they're trying to make it through difficulty and challenges with just a deposit. They're, they're trying to navigate through challenges on their job or challenges in their home with just a deposit. But, but the baptism with Holy Spirit is when Jesus takes you beyond just a deposit. What Jesus really wants to do is he wants to fully immerse you in Holy Spirit. That's what the baptism of Holy Spirit does. And as I pour more and more water in this glass, guess what's going to happen? It's starting to flow over. This is what it looks like when a person's life then becomes defined by the fruit of the Spirit. Because when you are full of Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control, all of those things that are the fruit of the Spirit are flowing out of your life. This is an answer to prayer for some of you because some of you are wondering, man, I don't understand why this person said they love the Lord, but they were just as nasty and cantankerous. They, they didn't love. There was no, no joy and no peace because they were trying to go through life with the deposit. Amen? Let me drink some of this. This is, this is really overflowing. Uh, tech team, I'm sorry. Mmm, it's so good. Amen? Amen. But that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to fill us to overflowing. That's what the baptism with Holy Spirit is all about. The Bible says the Holy Spirit brings gifts, but he also produces fruit in our life. That's that love and that joy and that peace. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace. Where? In the Holy Spirit. Some of you have been living life without joy, without peace, uh, really not even clear about your righteousness. Why? Because you've been trying to make it with the deposit. But the real essence of that life and that life more abundantly that Jesus came to give us flows through Holy Spirit. So in the little bit of remaining time that I have, now that I taught you what the three baptisms are, I want to show them to you in Scripture because they're all over. And so I want to show it to you because I really want you to get an understanding of this. Then I'm going to tell you how we're going to close. I want to show you Acts chapter 2 in verse 37. It says this. It says, now when they heard this, this is when Peter's preaching. They were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Their hearts were touched, and they said, what shall we do? Notice what Peter says to them. I'm showing you these three baptisms all through Scripture. Then Peter said to them, repent 
And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. So just right there, you see the three baptisms. The first thing he says is repent. That's salvation, right? That's the first baptism. The second baptism is when he says, and be baptized. He's talking about water baptism. And then he says, and then you'll get the third baptism, which is to receive the gift of Holy Spirit. Are you following me? Those are the three baptisms right there in Acts 2. I'll show you again in Acts chapter 8 and verse 14. It says, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received Holy Spirit. So notice what's going on here. All right? They hear that they're new converts in Samaria. They repented, right? And they believed. That's the first baptism, right? They believed. They accepted Jesus in their heart. They received the first baptism. Then it goes on and says that they were baptized with water. The problem, which is the second baptism, by the way, the problem was that they had yet to receive the Holy Spirit. And notice what the passage does not say. It does not say that when Peter and John heard this, that they went down there and gave them the right hand of fellowship. No, it doesn't say that. And I point that out because I don't know about your background, but, but, but my upbringing was I thought that that was it. I thought that, hey, you know, you, you open your heart to Jesus and uh, you maybe go to a couple of new members classes and then, you know, you got that Sunday afternoon service, you know, where you're going to get the right hand of fellowship. And I really believe that this is a part of the reason why many believers stumble. This is why I really believe many believers don't have the power that they need to live the life that God ordained for them to live because they don't have the power of Holy Spirit. They're just like these believers in Samaria. They have the first baptism and the second baptism, but they have yet to receive Holy Spirit. So Peter and John go to Samaria to make sure that these believers receive the final baptism. Let me show you Acts 19 and verse 1. It says, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said, well, uh, see, what had happened was, no, no. They, they say, we, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, well, into what then were you baptized? Watch this. So they said, well, into John's baptism. Ah, then Paul said, okay, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who was to come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit had come upon them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. Do you see it? The first baptism, when they believed. Second baptism, water baptism. Third baptism, Baptism with Holy Spirit. It, there's, there are so many scriptures that I can share with you to show this to you over and over and over and over again. But I, I want to show you this last one. John, 1 John 5 and verse 7 and 8. It says this. It says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, which is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. That's the Trinity, God in three persons. And there are three that bear witness on the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Each of these baptisms, each of these three things that 1 John 5, 7, and 8 just referenced, spirit, the water, and the blood, they represent a work that God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives, right? God wants us to have the first baptism. When I'm saved, I become a new person. And incidentally, that's all you need to go to heaven. That's all you need. You remember the thief on the cross, right? When he leans over and says to Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's it. He died. He went to heaven. That's all you need to go to heaven. So 
you don't need baptism with Holy Spirit to go to heaven. You need baptism with Holy Spirit to bring heaven down to earth. You need baptism with Holy Spirit to have the power to live the life that God called you to live here on earth. And so the first baptism, yes, you're saved, right? You accept Jesus in your heart. Second baptism, when you're water baptized, the old person is cut off. This is why we encourage you to be baptized. And our campus pastors challenge you to do that every single Sunday after you've accepted Jesus Christ. But the third baptism is what we're dealing with today. That's when you are baptized with Holy Spirit. That's when you receive the power to live the life that Christ gave up his life to give to us. The baptism with Holy Spirit gives you the supernatural power that you need to be who God calls you to be and to do what God calls you to do. And I'm taking my time to share this with you because some of you are excited, but you're tired. You're tired because you've been trying to do what God's called you to do out of your own power, and that's not the will of God for you. Holy Spirit is supposed to empower you to do what God called you to do. This is why, going back to Acts, Jesus tells the disciples, I want you to be my witnesses, but wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then you can do it. He, he says, I got great plans for you. I know that you're excited, but, but, but wait, because you cannot do it in your own power. You need Holy Spirit. Jesus literally tells the disciples, wait before you go change the world. Wait before you go start that business. Wait until you receive Holy Spirit because you cannot do it by yourself. He knew that if you all try to go change the world without the empowerment of Holy Spirit, nothing is going to happen. He was telling them, you cannot do what I've called you to do until you receive this additional baptism. If you try to do it in your own power and in your own flesh, in your own ability, it won't work. What a word for us. That's why Pentecost Sunday is so important. And I know some of you, you've been born again. You've accepted Jesus in your heart. And in that moment, Holy Spirit baptized you into the family of God, the moment that you were saved. But let me ask you this question. Have you asked Jesus to baptize you into Holy Spirit so that you have the power to be the wife and the husband and the parent and the CEO and the architect that God called you to be. I, I know, I know, I know some of you thinking, oh, I'm saved. I'm in a good church. I'm in the family of Christ. Yes, Holy Spirit baptized me into the body of Christ. Yes, but have you asked Jesus to baptize you with Holy Spirit? That's what Pentecost Sunday is about. The church was born on Pentecost Sunday because the disciples received the empowerment of Holy Spirit to be who God called them to be. You cannot have the power to live apart from Holy Spirit. this message. For more resources, visit the worship center cc.org and vanmoody.org. You will also find Van Moody on all social media platforms. Again, we thank you for your support.